close their visors and arm the launch escape system. Of course, once you have the Falcon 9 being loaded with propellant, you want a safety system that will allow the astronauts to get off the top of the rocket in case anything happens, and that automated safety system is in place. What makes it work are eight Super Draco thrusters that are on Dragon. They would fire and quickly separate the crew from the rocket. And they can do that either on the pad or during flight on the ride uphill.
And thanks for tuning in. You're watching live launch coverage of NASA and SpaceX's seventh rotational flight of astronauts and one cosmonaut to the International Space Station from the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. NASA astronaut Jessica Beer has been with us over the past three hours talking about Crew 7 as they have prepared for launch. Also talked a lot about science and a phenomenal number of other fascinating topics. <laughs> we really appreciate you being here. We're now closing in on T-minus one hour until liftoff. And your thoughts on how we've done so far? Things have been proceeding nominally, as we say, in the space business. Things are looking good. The leak, check, leak checks were good. Comm checks were good. The hatches are the hatches closed. I think we're in, in good shape. And the weather, what did we say? A 95% favorable odds for weather. So looking good. And I'm feeling good about it tonight. What about you, Daryl? Oh, I am feeling fantastic. And it's good. We both got the positive vibes going. You mentioned the weather. It's nearly perfect. Liftoff time still holding for 327 a.m. Eastern time and 27 seconds, if you're right down to the second. We're tracking no issues with the Falcon 9 or Dragon, as Jessica mentioned. The range is green. Weather, good to go. Over the past three hours, we want to review now what our crew's been doing. And there you see them. Jasmine Mobelli, Andreas Mogensen, Satoshi Furukawa, and Konstantin Borisov. They have been getting ready to launch into space. Let's take a moment now to recap the overnight launch preparations. After waking up and having a meal, SpaceX help the astronauts into their suits, as you can see right here at the historic quarters suit-up room. Then the crew, well, once they got their suits pressure tested, they walked right out of the same path that every NASA astronaut has done since Apollo 7, waving to family and loved ones after getting inside their Dragon. Teslas with the gold wing doors the coming down. Cycle to equalize they joined a car caravan led by Center Security on a 20-minute ride to Launch Complex 39A. Big smiles, Follow. big smiles all around. All the way around. And then following their arrival to the pad, they got a look at their rocket, and in they went, walking across the crew access arm and right into their spacecraft. And those big spot smiles you mentioned, Jessica, we just saw them right there. Looks like the crew, <laughs> they're, they're good to go. They truly are contagious, those smiles. It is difficult not to be smiling and excited when you know you are about to leave the planet for the first time for some of these, for, for Jasmine and for Constantine as well. Absolutely, and a lot of preparations have been brought to us at this point, including a dry dress. A lot of things have been going into this, so to get everybody ready, of course, we had a launch delay yesterday we stood down for that attempt, but now we're good to go, and we expect to be launching at 327 and 27 seconds, our new T-0. All systems good to go for launch. Now we want to take, uh, have and our Dragon team. SpaceX, you are go for Section 5. When ready, report go for launch. Dragon copies, go for Section 5. Okay, and with that call out at this time, we're going to expand our coverage. I'd like to welcome in SpaceX and NASA commentators joining us live from Hawthorne, California, where the SpaceX mission team is located. Welcome to Jesse and Leah. Thanks, Daryl, and hello to everyone watching around the world. I'm Leah Cheshire with NASA Communications. And I'm Jesse Anderson, an Integration and Test Engineering Manager here at SpaceX. Leah and I are joining you today from SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California, as we count down to liftoff of Crew 7 just under an hour from now. And of course, Crew 7 is our seventh operational mission with SpaceX, flying astronauts for long duration missions to the International Space Station, but it also comes with an important first. Crew 7 is the first mission in which every seat in the spacecraft is filled with a crew member from a different different international partner agency. Represented are NASA, ESA, the European Space Agency, JAXA, or the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency, and Roscosmos. It's also the first time an ESA astronaut has served as pilot of Dragon, so Andreas Mogensen is adding that to his list of accomplishments. The Dragon flying today will be making its third trip to station, having previously supported Crew 3 and Crew 5. And much like on those missions, our teams will be staffed around the clock in Mission Control, which is just behind us, to monitor Dragon and the mission, not just today, but throughout the entire mission, from liftoff to Crew 7's arrival at the space station, all the way through splashdown when the astronauts return back home to Earth. On console or headset in Mission Control are six key... 
SpaceX Our copies. Crew 7 positions. is go for launch. The mission director is in charge of the room and tasked with making real-time decisions to ensure mission success. The person that you may hear talking to the astronauts, which we just heard a few seconds ago, is the crew operations and resources engineer, who you'll hear us refer to as the core throughout the broadcast. And the four additional team members are focused on vehicle systems, including avionics, navigation and control, software, propulsion, life support, and communication with ground support teams. Apart from Mission Control, our Falcon 9 team is currently located in the Launch and Landing Control Center at Hangar X. With less than an hour until launch, they are settling in for final checkouts, propellant loading, and for launch. And of course, NASA has its own team members at NASA's Mission Control Center in Houston, Texas, who have been preparing the International Space Station for Dragon's arrival. They recently gave their go for launch and confirmed the station is ready to receive Dragon and the new crew. Now, upon liftoff, today's flight to the space station will take almost 30 hours with Dragon flying autonomously the entire way. And just like autopilot on a commercial aircraft, the crew always has the ability to take manual control of the spacecraft if needed. It continues to be a smooth countdown and we're looking good for an on-time liftoff. Coming up at T minus 45 minutes, the team will report their readiness for propellant load with a final go, no go poll. In the meantime, NASA's Courtney Beasley is going to help us take a closer countdown. look at Don't load and launch go no pole. Go no go poles open at fifty five dot eight zero procedure one dot one sixty. Thanks, Jesse. I'm here in the International Space Station Flight Control Room in Mission Control, Houston. What we have our sights set on today is low Earth orbit, which you'll sometimes hear us refer to as LEO. This is classified as orbits around Earth that are 1,200 miles or lower. There are a lot of satellites in this orbit, including the Hubble Telescope, and of course, today's destination, the International Space Station. The space station's orbit averages at 260 miles above Earth, but varies based on its apogee or perigee the highest and lowest points of its orbit. Being that the space station is 260 miles above Earth, crew members are too far away to make things out like cars, people, or buildings. But they can see other landmarks around the world, and the long camera lenses they use help them zoom in on familiar sites of our home planet. NASA astronaut Steve Bowen captured Cape Canaveral on Florida's Atlantic coast earlier this month near Cape Canaveral Space Force Station and NASA's Kennedy Space Center, where Crew 7 is launching from today. The contrast of the colors between the Indian River and Atlantic Ocean become much more pronounced from space. And here's a beautiful nighttime shot of the city lights of Mecca in the desert valley of western Saudi Arabia, captured by NASA astronaut Woody Hoburg on July 26th. Human presence on Earth becomes much easier to see at night. And this final image was captured by NASA astronaut Frank Rubio of Vadima Lake, one of the largest in Argentina, on May 7th. Each of these images are taken from the vantage point of the International Space Station that orbits roughly 260 miles above Earth. Satellites collect imagery of Earth, too, of course, but the International Space Station is unique in seeing these viewing opportunities because astronauts and cosmonauts can tell scientists on the ground what they're observing and what stands out in real time. We can't wait to see what Crew 7 captures, but for now, we'll send it back to Hawthorne. Jesse and Leah. SpaceX's ultimate mission is to make life multiplanetary. To get us there, we've been de developing a fully and rapidly reusable transportation system called Starship, the most powerful launch vehicle system ever developed and designed to carry passengers and cargo to Earth orbit, the moon, and planetary destinations like Mars. In fact, earlier today, the team completed a successful static fire of our super heavy Booster 9, an exciting step towards our next Starship flight test. But you have to learn to walk before you can run, or should I say fly. And our learning started with Dragon, designed from the beginning to transport both people and cargo to space. The Dragon hanging from the ceiling behind us was initially flown to certify SpaceX for cargo missions to the space station. Dragon launched to space in December 2010 and became the first private spacecraft to return from orbit. Two years later, Dragon became the first commercial spacecraft to deliver cargo to and from the space station and in 2020, as we remember well, became the first private crewed spacecraft to reach the International Space Station.
Altogether, the reusable Dragon spacecraft has completed nine human spaceflight missions and visited the International Space Station 38 times. Dragon is capable of carrying up to seven passengers to and from Earth orbit and beyond. And these days, we are very much focused on the beyond. Now, of course, we already have explorers on the Red Planet paving the way for humans who will arrive in the future. NASA's Perseverance rover landed on Mars in 2021 after an almost seven-month journey. Its mission addresses high priority science goals and also provides opportunities to gather knowledge and demonstrate technologies that address the challenges of future human expeditions to Mars. These include testing a method for producing oxygen from the Martian atmosphere, identifying other resources such as subsurface water, improving landing techniques, and characterizing weather, dust, and other potential environmental conditions that could affect future astronauts living and working on Mars. Now, of course, Perseverance also brought along another passenger named Ingenuity. This is the first helicopter ever flown on Mars. There's Ingenuity being deployed from Perseverance and those historic flights that we've seen so far. When the time comes for human explorers, they'll have to take everything with them for a surface mission. Building bases or even cities on Mars will require huge amounts of cargo and eventually crew. So we're designing Starship from the beginning to carry hundreds of tons of cargo into space and be able to be refueled in orbit. Before Mars, Starship will play a key role in the exploration of the moon. SpaceX is providing the lunar lander, which will return astronauts to the lunar surface for the first time in 50 years under NASA's Artemis missions. But the ability to deliver cargo and people to the lunar surface will be ready to help humanity build a sustainable presence on the moon and learn how to live off-world before the next step to Mars. Today, however, we are going a little closer to home, and the work we're doing on the space station also paves the way to Mars, but it takes place in low Earth orbit. As Courtney mentioned, the area in it includes any spacecraft that orbits at or less than 1,200 miles from our home planet. That's pretty close in comparison to our moon, which is almost 240,000 miles away, and is referred to as deep space. Deep space missions like future missions to Mars will challenge us like no spaceflight journey has before when we start looking to send humans millions of miles away from home. Long duration missions on the space station, just like Crew 7, directly inform how we'll plan to support the first humans bound for the Red Planet on missions that could last months or even years. So we really look forward to those human missions to Mars. And right now we're paving the way with today's exciting mission, plus through Artemis launches to the moon. For now, I'll send it back to Daryl and Jessica at KSC. Thank you very much, Leah and Jesse. And to keep our astronauts safe while on missions to the moon and Mars, NASA is working to understand the long-term effects of living in space. Earlier, NASA's Jasmine Hopkins caught up with NASA's chief deputy science officer for our human research program. One of the investigations launching on Crew-7 is nicknamed Cypher, and it will study the physiological and psychological changes in up to 30 astronauts. Joining us now to talk more about it is Kristen Fobb from Johnson Space Center. So Kristen, tell me about your title and the 14 different investigations that make up Cypher. Yes, I am the Deputy Chief Scientist at the Human Research Program and 14 research studies, all wrapped into one research complement called Cypher. What we want to do is study the impact of microgravity on bone, exercise, vision, behavioral health, and not only as individual elements, but how they all interconnect together. And not only do we want to study that, but we also want to understand the impact duration has on the human body and microgravity. This is going to be really important information for us for the Artemis missions and for Mars. Right, Kristen, and on that note, we have been studying in low Earth orbit for over 20 years now. So how is Cypher adding into that? Yes, 20 years, and we've learned a lot about the changes that happens in the human body in space. Plus, we also have learned a lot about the twin study that happened a few years back. So Cypher is just a build on top of all of that knowledge that we've gained so far, plus all of the technology that we have today, and data analysis. It's a great time to start Cypher. It really is. And after the launch of Crew 7, how soon can we expect to get the data back from Cypher? Well, once we start getting data, we'll start processing it. And then when we start to understand some of these observations and findings over hopefully these 30 crew, it's going to take time because 30, 30 crew, it's going to be a lot of information. But once we start to find some, some interesting observations, we'll let you know. Absolutely. It will be well worth the wait. Thank you so much for being here tonight, Kristen. It's my pleasure. Back to you.
All right, thank you, Jasmine and Kristen. We're going to turn it over now to Hawthorne, California, and check in with our team at SpaceX headquarters for an update on the launch progression. How are we doing? Thanks, Daryl. I'm Ronnie Foreman, a commercial sales manager here at SpaceX. We are coming up on just about 46 minutes until launch, and our teams are carefully moving through the process to lift off. A lot of preparations have brought us to this point today, including a dry dress rehearsal and static fire earlier this week. For those of you following along, you'll also know that we stood down from yesterday's launch attempt for additional data reviews. But for now, all systems are looking good for launch. So next up, our launch director will check in with the team for readiness, both for prop load and for launch. The seven SpaceX responsible engineers, often called REs, indicate that they are go by voting electronically. The launch director will also check in with the Dragon Mission Director, or MD, on the nets, and NASA Launch Manager to make sure we're, that they are ready to move forward as well. And as Jesse mentioned earlier, the Falcon and Dragon launch teams, as well as key NASA launch members, are in the Launch and Landing Control Center at Hangar X in Florida. On screen, you have that incredible view of the Dragon spacecraft with the crew access arm still in the service position. The crew right now is on board Dragon, waiting to get the green light to stow the crew arm for launch and arm the launch escape system. Great shot of our astronauts there. Once the launch director gives the go-ahead, we should get a good view of the access arm as it swings away from the capsule. The range continues to be go for launch, monitoring the clearance area surrounding our launch pad, as well as the air and sea space along the flight corridor. And at Kennedy Space Center, weather is looking good for launch. If you're joining us on the ground in Florida, you know it's just about 82 degrees outside with light ground winds. Overall, we are looking good for launch in just about 45 minutes with a 5% chance of weather violation. Right now, we are listening in for that readiness poll announcement and instructions to our launch team. Again, this poll is going to be the go or no go to move forward with propellant loading for today. As soon as that briefing ends, we should see that crew access arm, which you can see lit up on your screen right now, immediately start to move away from the capsule when that stow procedure begins. Coming up on just 43 minutes to launch. Great nighttime views of our Falcon 9 and Crew 7 capsule there on the screen. SpaceX Dragon. Go ahead, Dragon. Uh, we didn't hear the poll for a prop load and launch readiness. We're just giving a call. And sorry, Dragon, I just missed the last of your sentence there. Can you please repeat? Yeah, uh, from Dragon, we just didn't hear the poll. The polling is complete. The joint NASA and SpaceX teams have pulled go for LES arm, propellant load, and launch. For all operators in MCCX and Hangar X, both control rooms go into lockdown at T-minus 45 minutes and will remain in that state until the launch cave system is disarmed. All operators are to remain at their console and maintain a sterile cockpit until MD confirms successful disarming the launch cave system following orbit insertion 
or propellant offload in the event of a scrub. For non-urgent, no-go conditions, brief the CE or LD, and they will approve aborting the countdown. For urgent issues affecting the safety of the operation, operators shall call hold, hold, hold on the countdown net. Launch control will abort the launch audio sequence immediately and proceed into launch abort. At T minus 10 seconds, launch control will be hands off and relying on automated work criteria for the remainder of the count. Operators advise the launch director whether structural breakup or fire is imminent or occurring per Dragon manual escape flight rules. Launch control at this time, you may proceed with arming the crew arm for movement. Copy, proceeding to arm, crew arm for movement. And with that, we are moving forward toward launch. Propellant loading will begin in just over five minutes, but in the meantime, let's check back in with Daryl and Jessica. All right, thank you very much, Ronnie. Crew access so arm retraction it, started. We now have crew access arm retraction. So if you look in your screen, you can see there the crew access arm moving away from the Dragon. Another great shot of it there, articulating away. It takes about 90 seconds to two minutes to move away. And this is a critical milestone, Jessica, as that arm moves away, because now that means if the astronauts needed to get off that rocket for whatever reason, they could either bring the arm back quickly, and it can move, as I understand it, a lot faster than it's moving now in the case of uh, an emergency egress, or they would move forward and arm the launch escape system. That hasn't been armed yet. So this is the moving and stowing of the crew access arm so that we can clear that away from the rocket and get ready to lift off. After that... Crew access arm retraction complete. We're now waiting to hear that Dragon is go for Section 7, closing the visors and arming and the launch SpaceX, escape system. You are go for Section 6, close visors and arm launch escape system. Well, they changed the number, but it's the same. Dragon, Cappy, go for Section 6, launch escape system arming. Same milestone. I hear from previous crews that this system arms the very loud thump so they can actually hear that on board. Which makes sense. You've got those engines, the Super Dracos, Space which are... Dragon visors closed, arming launch escape system. Right there next to their heads, right? You know, because right. your go. Right, and sounds like that was Jasmine saying she was ready to arm, and that command can be sent from either the ground or the crew, and the crew is sending that command now to arm that system. And that launch escape system is, of course, the system that will propel us away from the rocket, the crew capsule itself with the crew inside, in the event of any type of emergency with the rocket. And that is, of course, a system that we hope to never use, but it consists of eight Super Draco thrusters on this Dragon vehicle that are used only for this abort. And we say we hope to never use it, we hope to not be in the situation, but we have had situations where we've had incredible in-flight tests. Unintentional, for example, there was the launch abort for the Soyuz for Nick Haig's first launch in 2018. Pretty exciting event, dynamic time, but something that showed us how robust these systems are. It performed nominally and carried Nick Haig and Alexei Ovchinin back to safety. We got the verification of the launch escape system now armed. You mentioned Nick Haig. As I understand it, he counts himself having gone to space twice. That's <laughs> right, or at least one and a half. <laughs> but this system is now active. They do that two minutes before loading of the props, since that, of course, then does prevent present a more risky situation with that prop on board. And it will stay armed all the way through orbital insertion. I've also been told by previous Dragon crews that you can hear the system of valves opening and actually even the flow of the fu fuel itself as it comes on board.
the scenarios in which the launch escape system will be used. F-9 tanks venting for prop load in 10 seconds. Expect loud venting. There they are warning them about that exactly what you just uh, mentioned, giving them a heads up that they'll be hearing those sounds. Yeah, Victor Glover was telling me it's a very noticeable process. You can hear the opening and closing of the valves, and there are these low hums and kind of a fluttering sound as that super cold liquid oxygen and kerosene fill those large propellant tanks, first on the first stage and then on the second stage. It must be pretty exciting to be hearing those noises, knowing what that means and how much closer you're getting to liftoff. This is pretty unique in the launch industry, right? Where the astronauts are inside the Dragon, inside their spacecraft, as it's being loaded with propellants. That's correct. That launch escape system you're talking about, if it were if it were needed it can get the crew several miles offshore out into the Atlantic Ocean it's uh, those super Draco engines capable of moving dragon half a mile in just 7.5 seconds so that's equivalent to a peak velocity of 436 miles per hour so it really moves it can also get it off the top of a moving rocket as well, so right. it's got to have that kind of power. Right, at all those different phases all the way un until they're in orbit. And that's one of the things that we protect for here as well when we look at the weather forecast. It's not just for the actual launch itself, but to protect for any of those contingency landing scenarios in the various areas where they would splash down in that event. Propellant load has started. And so now the propellants are flowing into the Falcon 9 rocket, RP-1, refined kerosene, and liquid oxygen, the oxidizer. That part we can see externally because as the liquid oxygen levels rise inside the Falcon 9, it of course, super chilled liquid oxygen, highly densified, and it will super chill the skin as well of the rocket and it will condense the air around it. And there's been well over 200 Falcon 9 launches, so if you've seen one before, you're familiar with the site. The rocket uh, condensing that air, that uh, warm, humid. Florida air, which we have been enjoying this evening, at least with a light breeze. <laughs> That's right. I think it's cooler than Houston anyway, so <laughs> I'm enjoying my time here. Good, good. All right. Uh, for another update, let's send it out to Hawthorne, California, an update from SpaceX. Thanks, Daryl and Jessica. Now, before we send them to space, let's get to know our Crew-7 astronauts a little better. We'll start off with none other than the commander herself, NASA astronaut Jasmine Mabelli, making her debut spaceflight. My name is Jasmine Mabelli. I'm the commander of NASA's SpaceX Crew-7 mission to the International Space Station. Baldwin, New York is where I grew up. I always loved team sports from a really young age because you rely on one another, and that's something that I think is really important to know going forward in your career. I joined the Marine Corps. Sure, I wanted to fly jets. I thought you had to be a jet pilot to become an astronaut. I actually went to watch STS-116 launch while I was waiting to start flight school, and Sunny Williams happened to be on that flight. I realized she was a Navy helicopter pilot, and from that point on, I went full steam ahead all four of us are so proud to represent what is possible when we come together. Ultimately, everything we do is to benefit the Earth. Right next to Jasmine in Dragon Endurance is Andreas Mogesen, today's pilot representing the European Space Agency and making his second trip to low Earth orbit. 
My name is Andreas Mogensen, and I'm the pilot of NASA's SpaceX Crew 7 mission to the International Space Station. I was born in Copenhagen, Denmark. In 2008, ESA were looking to select a new class of astronauts, and I applied together with about 8,500 Europeans. So I thought, there's just no way that I'll get selected. The uh, chances of being selected are, are too small. But that changed when we were down to about 20 candidates. My first mission to the International Space Station was on a short 10-day mission. Uh, I had to hit the ground running as soon as I arrived on board, and as soon as I landed back on the Earth, I knew that I wanted to go back to the space station. I'm especially proud of the fact that our Crew 7 mission has four different astronauts from four different countries and four different agencies. Next up, mission specialist Satoshi Furukawa. This JAXA astronaut is no stranger to the space station after spending 165 days in orbit as part of expeditions 28 and 29 in 2011. My name is Satoshi Furukawa. I am a mission specialist for NASA SpaceX Crew 7 mission to the International Space Station. I was born in Yokohama, Kanagawa, which is right south of Tokyo first human landing on the moon when I was five years old. I thought it was a great moment for humankind. I had a longing for space from my childhood. The moment I was selected as a Japanese astronaut candidate, you are hired, you are selected. It was the happiest moment in my life. Crew 7, we are conducting many scientific researches on the space station to benefit future space explorers. I am very proud of being a part of this excellent team of international partners and also researchers, engineers, flight controllers, flight directors, and so on. Because working as a team and working together, we can accomplish the big mission. Rounding out our fully international crew is Roscosmos cosmonaut Konstantin Borisov. He, he was selected to the cosmonaut corps in 2018 and, marks, and today marks his first flight to the orbiting laboratory. My name is Konstantin Borisov and I'm a mission specialist for NASA's SpaceX Crew 7 mission to the International Space Station. For those who ask what space flight is. I would say that we have three big jobs on the space station. First job is experiments. Second job is take care of the station, doing the maintenance, repair what's broken, storing things, restoring things, cleaning up. And the third big topic is actually taking care of your body because in weightlessness you cannot help but train. I think many people don't understand that technology advancement which we have had during the last 50 years mainly comes from space exploration. People get very comfortable with using their phone and have very fast computers and space motivates us to create those advancements. I want to take part in it and I want to put my small stone into this pavement which leads us to the new asteroids, to the new planets and to the new systems. Now, as we see with all of our crews, these four crew members who make up Crew 7 have a mission patch they worked together to design. The first thing that you notice is the white dragon on top of the Earth. Its neck craned into the number seven for Crew 7. Its tail curves upwards towards a golden star, and they say that symbolizes our ascent towards the stars and the pioneering spirit needed to propel us further into space. The blue, white, and red on the tail are the common colors in the flags of all four nations flying on this mission. Now we are less than 30 minutes to launch, so let's check back in with Daryl and Jessica at KSC, where the countdown continues. All right, thank you very much. Everything going uh, well with the countdown so far. A little over a mile and a half from the launch pad we're going from today, this morning, 39A, is 39B where the mobile launcher is back out on the pad right now, going through testing for the Artemis II crewed mission to the moon late next year. Here's more about Artemis in our Moon Minute. For the first time, Artemis II astronauts got an up-close look at the Orion spacecraft that will fly them around the moon. Astronauts Reed Wiseman, Victor Glover, Christina Cook, and Jeremy Hansen visited Orion at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. 
and it looks amazing. Their handiwork is gorgeous. I'm ready to take it for a spin. Until launch day arrives, the crew is training at the Johnson Space Center in Texas. They use the Neutral Buoyancy Lab, a giant pool, to practice safely getting out of a floating mock-up of Orion. And it's not an easy task. Navy divers in rafts will harness and hoist the astronauts into the air by helicopter where they will be taken to a nearby Navy vessel. Back at Kennedy, we got a look at the brand new Artemis crew transportation vehicles. So the first nine miles of the journey to the moon starts in these crew transport vehicles. On launch day, these fully electric, zero mission vehicles by Canoe Technologies will reunite the Artemis II astronauts with Orion at Launch Complex 39B. NASA's powerful moon rocket, the Space Launch System, and Orion will carry them on the rest of the 250,000 mile journey to the moon. And that's your Artemis Moon Minute. And for Artemis updates, there's a QR code on the bottom left of your screen, right there, actually bottom right. You can visit, uh, you can use your cell phone to scan it, or you can visit the website at nasa.gov forward slash Artemis2. Earlier this evening, our own NASA's Jasmine Hopkins caught up with NASA Administrator Bill Nelson, who is here watching the launch from SpaceX's firing room. Administrator Nelson, today marks a first for NASA, the first time in a single launch that each astronaut represents a different space agency. So we have NASA, ESA, JAXA, and Roscosmos. What do you make of this diverse crew? Well, it's a sign of our times. Uh, we are an international program. For example, we're going back to the moon in order to go to Mars. It's going to be an international mission that will launch with an international crew. So, too, tonight's launch is entirely an international crew, save for the commander, Jasmine, an American astronaut. And so here we go. Now, isn't it interesting that what space does in our NASA program, it unifies us. It brings people together. Uh, and this is so true with what we're seeing tonight. Right. And Administrator, you recently visited South America, and later on this year you're planning to visit India as well. Why is it so important for NASA to foster these international partnerships? They are delighted, indeed, eager to learn more about NASA and to partner with NASA. And so that's what we find when we go to another country. Uh, it's usually the president that wants to see us. And for example, in this South American trip, uh, we talked to the president of Brazil and Colombia about what NASA can provide in the way of information from our satellites to help them protect the Amazon rainforest from being destroyed, which is a high agenda item for those countries. Indeed, it's a high agenda item for the entire world. Um, I'm going to India. India is uh, one that we want to have a close relationship with. We've already been doing things such as uh, science experiments with India. We've got a major science uh, program going that will be Earth observing with India next January. But now we're going to train and fly an Indian uh, astronaut. So. It is happening as we speak, and uh, the United States has been the benef beneficiary of it. Absolutely. Administrator Nelson, thank you so much. Back to you. As we continue to count down, let's take a closer look at the vehicles that will be taking Crew 7 to the International Space Station today. Starting from the very top of the vehicle is the Dragon spacecraft. In total, there are 16 Draco thrusters Dragon can use in space to help navigate the spacecraft to its destination, each providing 90 pounds of force. That doesn't include the eight Super Draco thrusters used for an abort, which are no longer active once the crew is in orbit. And just wanted to note one thing that we did miss just a moment ago was a call to the crew. Uh, there was a, a, 
uh, sensor issue that they are tracking. However, um, they are just continuing with the count, continuing to monitor it. And so we are continuing to discuss what we have in front of us, which is Dragon. Together, the Dragon spacecraft and its trunk stand over 26 feet tall. There are two windows on the spacecraft, plus one under the nose cone. The nose cone opens shortly after launch to expose the forward bulkhead thrusters and docking mechanism that will connect with the space station. Dragon's trunk holds solar cells, which power Dragon while it's in free flight. The trunk can also carry unpressurized cargo, and on some cargo resupply missions, we use Dragon's trunk to deliver the new solar arrays that are being installed on the space station. As always, Dragon will be delivered to orbit today by SpaceX's Falcon 9 rocket, which provides 1.7 million pounds of thrust on its first stage, thanks to its nine Merlin M1D engines. Once the first and second stages separate, these engines are also used to help land the first stage. The first stage will perform three burns today as it makes its way back down to Earth. First is the boost back burn, where three of the M1D engines will reignite to help flip the first stage around to head back to the launch site. The second burn is the entry burn. That's where a single engine will reignite and shut down to help slow Falcon 9 down as it prepares to re-enter the Earth's atmosphere. And then finally, the landing burn. That'll be where three engines will slow down the rocket enough to perform a precision landing back down on landing zone one. Meanwhile, the second stage continues to orbit, powered by one single Merlin vacuum engine with over 220,000 pounds of thrust. The second stage will secure Dragon's entry into low Earth orbit before separating, leaving Dragon to continue its journey to the space station on its own thrusters. About 40 seconds after, Dra after separation, Dragon's nose cone deploy sequence will begin, exposing its guidance navigation controls that help Dragon autonomously fly to the space station. With T0 coming up in just about 20 minutes, our teams at the Cape in Hangar X are doing a series of system checks to ensure Dragon and Falcon 9 are ready. Let's check in with Ronnie for a quick status update. How's it going, Ronnie? Thanks, Jesse. We are still looking good for an on-time launch just over 20 minutes from now, and we'll hey, keep team, monitoring RV1 all the vehicle complete. systems. There we heard the call out for RV-1 load complete on stage two. Um, so that means we are, of course, getting closer to liftoff. Both Dragon and Falcon 9 continue to be healthy, and we're not tracking any major issues at this time. Right now, we're continuing to prep the vehicle for flight, and propellant loading began at T minus 35 minutes. We also heard the call out a few minutes ago that the launch escape system is now armed. The range, which is monitoring keep out zones and among other key flight requirements, also continues to report no issues and they are go to support launch tonight. Weather also looks good and we are still tracking just a 5% chance of violation at our T0 time. But as a reminder, today we have an instantaneous launch window driven by the orbital mechanics constraints of two spacecraft meeting in orbit. Fun fact, the technical term for that meeting is called a rendezvous. So at this point, if we hear a hold for any reason, we will have to stand down tonight because of that instantaneous launch window and instead target our backup opportunity, which is tomorrow at 3.04 a.m. Eastern time. But for now, with all systems go, let's turn it back over to Courtney for a status update from Houston. Thanks, Ronnie. The flight controllers here in Mission Control Houston are ensuring that the space station is ready to receive Dragon. They're also checking all communication links between the station, Dragon, and the ground are working properly, and right now everything is proceeding as planned. Teams here in Mission Control Houston, the team in Hawthorne, and the astronauts aboard the station will monitor the autonomous docking of Dragon tomorrow when they enter joint operations, which happens when the spacecraft enters the approach ellipsoid, which is an invisible boundary that helps us monitor spacecraft arriving and departing. After docking, the crews will perform a series of leak checks, then work to open the hatches both on the Dragon side and inside the station's pressurized mating adapter. We expect hatch opening to hap happen about an hour and a half after docking. Once on board, the astronauts will be greeted by the space station crew and will then join in for opening remarks for the new crew members. Here in Mission Control, Flight Director Chris Dobbins is on console overseeing the team for launch and Flight Director Judd Freeling will be on console tomorrow for docking. That's it from here in Mission Control Houston. I'll toss it back to the team in Florida. Daryl, how's it looking? All right, thank you very much, Courtney. And if you just joined us, T-minus 17 minutes and counting, from the seventh astronaut rotation mission to the International Space Station under NASA's commercial crew program. Commander Jasmine Mogbelli, pilot Andreas Mogensen, Andy Mogensen, 
and mission specialist Satoshi Furukawa and Kasing Borisov are strapped into their seats inside the Dragon Endurance. They're at the top of the rocket, Falcon 9 rocket fueling. That operation is well underway. Launch escape system is armed. Of course, that means Dragon is prepared and to Dragon launch itself. SpaceX. Stand by for an update on the sensor. Teams are still discussing and looking for our path forward. As you just heard there, SpaceX is SpaceX, happy. looking at a sensor issue. And so trying to determine if the sensor is giving good data, good reading, or if... Startup stage two, lock floating. If they're looking at something else, of course, we'll keep close tabs on that. In the meantime, propellant load continues. I think sometimes you have hits on sensors for other reasons. We want to make sure that we are getting an accurate reading of what's happening with the system they're looking at. Probably trying to decide if it's a, a real signal or if it's a hit from some other reason. There's a lot of redundancy in the systems, as you mentioned, and those sensors have to be make sure that the engineers understand exactly what they're looking at. So we'll, again, keep tabs. In the meantime, here's a little bit about Crew 7. Lieutenant Colonel Jasmine Mogbelli, a military helicopter test pilot. There she is. She hails from Long Island, New York. She's a mother to two twin girls, and she is the mission commander. This is pilot Andy Mogensen's second trip to space station. His first was as the flight engineer for the ESA IRIS mission in 2015. Mission Specialist Satoshi Furukawa's interest in space began when he was five years old and he saw the Apollo 11 moon landing on TV. And Mission Specialist Konstantin Borisov was selected to be a cosmonaut in 2018 and this will be his first trip to space. We've got... Uh, more than 10,000 people all gathered, including these folks. Some special students. Uh, those kids are, I should call them kids, they're students, right? Uh, college students. They're part of the First Nations launch, and they're giving us a big wave from the Banana Creek viewing location. They're from the University of Washington, University of Colorado, and Queens University. They're visiting as part of NASA's First Nations launch, an Artemis student challenge, where they design, build, and launch their own high-powered rockets. And those students that you saw there in the stands, they were the grand prize winners. So welcome and enjoy the launch. T-minus 14 minutes and counting. Awaiting Crew 7 are seven crew members at their destination at the International Space Station. I caught up with three of them as they were zipping around the Earth. Hey, Daryl, good morning. Well, good morning to you, Frank, Stephen, and Woody. Okay, minutes away from liftoff, you're inside the spacecraft. What's it like? The rocket is a living, breathing machine. Uh, we fuel the Falcon 9 rocket on the pad while the crew is on board. I expected that my heart would be racing, but actually it was just so much like training that I felt quite calm. Well, I'm sure calm will give way to excitement, right, when Crew 7 comes aboard. What do you think that'll be like? More than anything, it's your friends coming up to station, right? And so you get to hug and uh, greet your friends that you haven't seen for several months. Uh, and it's always just a really fun reunion. You know, they're coming on board. They're going to live on board. It's really exciting to greet them as uh, new friends and crewmates. Well, those new friends and crewmates, will you have any advice for them when they come on board, like things to do, things not to do? The awesome thing is that we have an amazing ground team that catches all of it uh, and keeps us uh, honest and, and keeps us out of trouble. And so you can just kind of uh, relax and enjoy it and just uh, allow yourself to take it in because it really is a pretty special experience. Really enjoy your time up here uh, with the people, with the environment, and with the opportunity to, uh, to work up here and look at the earth. It's, it's really amazing. Just really enjoy it. All right, speaking of enjoyment, 
Do you have a fun way to confirm that you're in space, something you can do? You want to give that move a score, Jessica? I don't know. It required assistance from two crew members, so I don't know. I'll, I'll give it an 8.5. Oh, God, that was very kind. All right, well, before the Crew-7 uh, got into their spacecraft, they got a picture with the Falcon 9 booster that will take them up into space. And there, there they are on the business end of those nine Merlin engines. Once we leave planet Earth, these fine folks at Johnson Space Center will take and over. Dragon, this is Mission Control. We are still continuing to assess that sensor and proceeding with the count. Okay, so as you heard, they're... SpaceX Dragon copy is continuing with the count while the two of us. Still working the sensor, but at the same time, continuing to load the propellants on board Falcon. So, Jessica, as we count down these last few minutes, you've got the launch team. They're taking a look at they're taking a look at a sensor and some of the readings there. At the same time, we're proceeding forward, and they're communicating with the astronauts inside. And so, as we uh, get down to these final minutes, any thoughts? This is an exciting time for the crew. You know, they're probably running through some checklists of their own right now. They may, may be pretty busy in there going through those same things that they've done in their simulations so many times before. But I bet it's getting pretty real right now. And hearing those calls about the sensor probably raises a few questions as well. But I know the ground will keep them performed as we go. Ten minutes. It's getting very close. Indeed it is. And tracking everything are Leah and Ronnie. At SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California, will take us through the rest of the count. Thanks, Daryl. Our next major countdown event will be at the T minus 10 minute mark, so coming up here, and when Dragon the Falcon 9 Dragon launched. Stand by for display configuration. There we go ahead and have the Dragon, Dragon astronauts are standing by for dis display configuration, which will let them know that we are even closer to liftoff. The launch commit criteria that we're waiting to hear that call out for are specific thresholds and pieces of information about the entire Falcon 9 system needed to make sure that the rocket is healthy. Of course, we do have many systems in place to ensure that the rocket and crew are both safe leading up to liftoff and during flight. Coming up on nine minutes until liftoff today, which is also about the same amount of time it takes to get to orbit. A nine minute ride, uh, that's about the time we'll, we'll see second stage cutoff. A few minutes after that is when we'll see Crew Dragon separate from the second stage. And we'll be listening to some performance calls as we get into the final countdown, of course, and then after liftoff. Uh, on the ground, you'll hear SpaceX flight controllers reporting on trajectory, speed, booster performance, and other key milestones. But there are some other calls you'll hear the crew make also after liftoff. These are different abort zones. They come in the form of different number and letter combinations. And these are throughout the flight up the eastern seaboard. So the first two are 1A and 1B. They have that name because they're in the first stage. That lasts until they're up to the very north of North Carolina. And the next are 2A through 2E. Those come into play when the second stage is powering Dragon. That takes us from the top of North Carolina all the way to the tip of Newfoundland in the northern Atlantic. Now, a little bit different from the other naming system, you'll hear the call Shannon, which refers to Shannon, Ireland, meaning they would target off the coast of Ireland if they were later in that second stage and needed to abort. You'll hear those different calls uh, throughout the flight uphill, along with key performance call outs from the guidance, navigation and control officer, as well as the propulsion lead.
One of the next call outs that we're listening for is the announcement that stage one engine chill has started. Right now, the propellant in the tanks is isolated from the engines, but at T minus seven minutes, we'll open up the engine pre-valves and start passing just a trickle of liquid oxygen through the Merlin engine pumps, chilling the engines for the start sequence. We do this because the super chilled and densified liquid oxygen is really cold, and we use that small amount of LOX to engine basically prepare the engine hard. There's the call out for engine chill. So now we're basically preparing that engine hardware to flow all of the locks and propellant into it during flight. Next up, we should hear the call out for stage one RP1 load completion. And Dragon SpaceX, stand by for final go, but please confirm crew displays are configured for launch. SpaceX Dragon, crew displays are configured for launch. All right, we heard their crew displays. Those three screens from which they can monitor the mission are configured for launch. H1, RP1 load is complete. In confirmation that RP1, the densified kerosene or the rocket fuel that propels the crew into orbit, loading is complete on the first stage. We did hear the second stage was completed a short time ago as well. Now T minus six minutes until launch. We are still loading liquid oxygen on the first and second stages. This is the oxidizer we need to combine with the densified kerosene that just finished loading. Coming up, we will hear the call for Dragon to configure for terminal count and then transition to internal power at about five minutes until launch. Then we'll hear the propellant tanks on Falcon 9 are getting ready to pressurize, adding some additional rigidity and structural support as we get ready for the strong back to retract. It'll move just a couple of degrees at first, and then we'll see it swing open completely at the moment of liftoff. That strong back provides access to Falcon 9's fueling lines and umbilicals for the prop load and the different gases being loaded on board. So we're continuing to check through a couple of more fueling milestones, including one around the two minute mark, where we will hear that the liquid oxygen is finished on board the second stage. Dragon is configured for terminal count, and Dragon's on internal power. Falcon tanks are pressurizing for strong back retract. So there we heard the call out that we are preparing for strong back retract. And as Leah just mentioned, the strong back is that white truss structure that you see on the left side of Falcon 9. Got a better shot of it right there. Strong back is retracting. Just before lift. There we heard the call out from Mission Control that we are retracting the strong back now. The strong back is part of the transporter erector, which was used not only to roll Falcon 9 out to the launch pad, but also to raise it into its vertical position. It will retract just about two degrees first after those clamp arms open up around the base of Dragon's trunk. And then just before liftoff, we'll actually go all the way back to 45 degrees retracted to give Falcon 9 and Crew 7 room for liftoff. Now under four minutes until launch. Next up, we're looking for the first stage liquid oxygen loading to finish at T minus three minutes. You're starting to see some white clouds on your screen. That is vapor, it's normal. We'll continue to see that build up as we get closer to launch. Obviously, this liquid oxygen that we're loading is super chilled, so a little bit of that will boil off in the hot Florida air. Stage one lock loading is complete. Great view of crew seven there inside of the Dragon spacecraft awaiting liftoff just under three minutes from now. Dragon is in terminal count. Now, now about two minutes and 30 seconds until launch. 
Next milestone, we're looking up for stage two locks load to complete. Additionally, shortly after that, we'll hear gas closeout begin, isolating the feed lines from the different gas systems for the Falcon 9 rocket. Those will get vented overboard through the umbilicals and the strong back itself. Stage two, lock floating is complete. Dragon is an auto idle. Confirmation that stage two locks load is complete. Dragon and Falcon 9 fully fueled. Gas closeout has started. Expect loud venting. There's the gas closeout call that we expected. Additionally, we will be in auto idle. This puts the rocket in a state the flight computers understand before it takes over, making sure the transition to final countdown is smooth. Coming up at T minus one minute, we'll hear that Dragon is in countdown. Its computer will switch to countdown mode. We'll also hear that the flight termination system on Falcon 9 is armed. Falcon 9 is in startup. Dragon's in terminal count. Dragon's flight computer in countdown and configured for launch and the flight termination system now armed less than a minute until liftoff today. Dragon, the flight termination Go system. You heard it, Crew 7 getting the go for launch, just 30, 30 seconds, seconds away for an on-time launch. At the time of liftoff today, the space station will be flying 260 miles over southeastern Iraq. T minus 15. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Engine full power. And lift off. Go Falcon, go Dragon, go Crew 7. Endurance ascends an international crew Copy, destined alpha. for the International Space Station. Stage one That's propulsion 1. 7 is million. nominal. Good calls from the propulsion officers here. Propulsion's nominal. 1.7 million pounds of thrust on Falcon 9, taking Crew 7 to the International Space Station, now traveling almost 300 miles per hour. Nominal power and telemetry. We are just about 10 plus 45 seconds into the seventh rotational crew mission on board Dragon and Falcon 9. And right now the vehicle is throttling down to help us pass through the period of maximum dynamic pressure. There's the call out that Crew 7 is now moving faster than the speed of sound. Stage one, throttle up. Confirmation, we have moved through max Q and are throttling back up. Copy, one Bravo. Heard that call from Jasmine on Crew 7, as well as confirmation from the ground. The call out for one Bravo means we are in the second and final abort mode for the first fact, stage, chill continuing to get good performance. We've got in, uh, engine chill on the second stage MVAC engine. We will then be looking for MECO or main engine cutoff where the nine engines on the first stage will cut off ahead of the first and second stages separating. Then the, not, the single Merlin vacuum engine on the second stage will ignite. We are now coming up on two minutes into the flight, the spacecraft traveling over 2,000 miles per hour. Really incredible nighttime views of Falcon 9 and Crew 7 on your screen right now. So as Leah just mentioned, we are keeping an eye on a couple of critical flight milestones coming up back to back here. Stage one, Those down. are going to be Nico. So main engine cutoff now that we're throttling down stage one, followed by stage separation and second stage ignition. Main engine cutoff. Stage separation confirmed. 
Copy, to Alpha. And back ignition. So there you heard and saw Miko stage step, and hopefully you heard Jasmine call out for the two alpha abort mode just before second stage ignition. And of course, this is the second stage powering Dragon on its flight, now traveling almost 4,000 miles per hour. Over three minutes since launch, the second stage will continue to power the spacecraft. And our first look at the crew inside. We'll be standing by for Seco. That's the next major milestone for this second stage engine. That comes shortly before nine minutes into the flight. So we've still got some time on this engine. So right now, while Crew-7 makes its way to orbit, our first stage booster is making its way back to land. So you may hear the callouts here on the net shortly that we are in the middle of our boost back burn. Right now, stage Great. one is coasting. Hey, SpaceX, trajectory nominal. Good callouts there that Dragon is on the right track. <laughs> and confirmation from Commander Jasmine McBelly. Continuing to see good performance on this lone Merlin vacuum engine on the stage. Also, as we've heard, nominal trajectory. That's the guidance navigation and control officer here at SpaceX stating that we are on the correct path. Dragon's pointed in the right direction. The second stage continues firing until, like we mentioned, the second stage engine cutoff at about eight minutes and 50, five zero seconds into the flight. Right now, we are four minutes and 30 seconds since our on-time liftoff, now traveling at 5,000 miles per hour. This single Merlin vacuum engine can provide over 220,000 pounds of thrust in the vacuum of space, doing its job to take our crew to the International Space Station today. Dragon SpaceX, trajectory nominal. More good news from Mission Control. Acquisition of signal, Marina. So with that Bermuda call out, we actually know that the ground station transmitting this flight data back to us is coming from Bermuda. The crew is currently pulling a little more than one G as the second stage engine continues to propel their flight. Continuing to hear good calls to the crew now five minutes and 30 seconds into the flight traveling at 6,400 miles per hour. Again, we will continue to see the second stage fire for about three more minutes. Shortly after second stage engine cutoff, we will see it separate Dragon from Speed Dragon, which will continue normal. its journey. Now, at this point in the flight, we are just about 15 seconds away from stage one entry burn start. At this point, the center engine on Falcon 9 will be lit for just about 10 seconds to help us slow the vehicle down as it re-enters the Earth's atmosphere. That's not the only thing helping us on re-entry, though. The first stage sees high drag on re-entry, which scrubs roughly 70% of the velocity by the time the landing burn begins, which you just had great views of on the left-hand side of your screen. Florida Space Coast beginning to come into view in the background. All while Crew 7, of course, on the right hand side of your screen, lit up by that MVAC engine, continues on its way to orbit. And we are now coming up on. Continuing to get good calls as we reach almost seven minutes into the flight. Crew traveling at 9,400 miles per hour. Again, we still have about one minute, 45 seconds left with the second stage propelling the crew. And of course, we are also expecting that landing burn start from Falcon 9 any second now. Great views.
stage. FTS has saved. Great news there that stage one has successfully landed back at landing zone one in Florida. And stage two continues to propel Dragon and our crew seven crew members. We now are coming up on Seco, second stage engine cutoff. Again, looking at that about eight minutes and 50 seconds into the flight. Everything continues as planned today, now traveling over 13,000 miles per hour. Again, we're looking for eventually a good orbital insertion at which we'll be traveling. Good calls here at Mission Control in Hawthorne. And we are standing by for second stage engine cutoff. Copy, Shannon. Heard that call for Shannon. That is the call out for Shannon, Ireland, the final abort zone. MVAC shut down. There's audio confirmation, and you can see on your screen that we have had successful state second engine cutoff one of our MBAC engine. Dragon SpaceX, nominal orbit insertion. Dragon. And good news there, that Crew-7. Nominal orbital insertion. Dragon SpaceX. Awesome to hear. Disarmed. That's the first look at the crew. Now in microgravity, confirmation of a good Earth orbit insertion. We are now coming up on 10 minutes into the flight. Of course, we saw second stage engine cutoff, and you're actually getting a look at their zero G indicator there. Uh, we'll stand by for them to tell us a little bit more about that shortly. But we are also standing by for second stage separation from Dragon. So as Leah mentioned right now, Dragon and Stage 2 are still attached. Great views of that zero-G indicator there. And what we're doing right now is basically letting any residual dynamics of the vehicle settle out prior to separation. We are expecting that separation event in probably about 90 seconds. Crew looks like they're having a great time up in space, too. And as we stand by for that separation, shortly thereafter, we'll be looking for the nose cone to begin deploying. Uh, that command will be sent, and we'll see it open shortly after. We'll need the nose cone to open to expose those forward bulkhead thrusters, as well as the docking mechanism with which they will use to uh, link up with the International Space Station. After their ride, it's almost 30 hours long. Again, we had liftoff right on time today at 3.27 a.m. Eastern time. The crew making a smooth journey into orbit. It's now been 11 minutes, 20 seconds since that liftoff. We had confirmation of good orbital insertion, and we are standing by for second stage separation okay. from Dragon. Great views of mission control here in Hawthorne, California. And the SpaceX team standing in the background, standing by for Dragon separation. Of course, you also have continued telemetry readouts from Dragon and Stage 2 in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. Crew 7, on and behalf of the Falcon gone. team, I'd like to welcome you to orbit, and we hope you enjoyed the ride on Falcon 9. Space travel is difficult, even though you make it look easy, so thank you for trusting us to get you up there. 
it's not a bad way to spend a day in the office. Stand by for words from the launch director. Hello, Crew 7. This is Launch Director here on Countdown. On behalf of the entire SpaceX launch and recovery team, I'm honored to welcome Dragon's first ever all international crew to orbit. Shisleva Puti, Gotor, Itera Shai. Godspeed, Crew 7. Cheers. SpaceX, uh, thanks for the ride. It was awesome. On behalf of Andy, Satoshi, Toshi, and I, we'd like to thank the multitude of people who've led us to this unique moment. We may have four crew members on board from four different nations, Denmark, Japan, Russia, and the USA, but we're a united team with a common mission. Uh, we hope the work we do serves to benefit our beautiful home planet and those on it. As you said, human spaceflight requires an unparalleled level of vigilance and rigor, and we thank all those who prepared not only us, but also this truly impressive spacecraft for flight. Finally, to our families, for the brave, greater burden of our choice to explore. Thank you. Go Crew 7. Awesome ride. Really incredibly moving words from Commander Jasmine Mogbelli now that she and her international team are up in space. That is going to end our coverage from Hawthorne until we pick back up with our docking coverage, like Leah mentioned, just about 30 hours for now, from now. But for now, I'm going to hand it back over to Daryl and Jessica at Kennedy Space Center to wrap up our launch coverage tonight. All right. Thank you very much and great job. And Jessica, what a, what a launch. It was spectacular. Like we said, those night launches are something to see. You see all those bright lights. You see those little nitrogen pulses when that first stage is coming back down. Spectacular. Phenomenal roar, the thunder. You could feel it in your chest. And then, of course, the booster came back and landed, and that was some extra pop. Pretty impressive all around. Sights, sounds, and even those feelings. That's new, of course, to crew, uh, to NASA crew, is bringing the booster back. Uh, NASA decided they have a lot of prop margin, uh, propellant that is, and so they burn the first stage a little less and the second stage a little more and allows them to bring the first stage back and back to land, which is uh, good to see. And so you saw the uh, zero-G indicator floating around. Tell us what it was. I did. Well, that, Daryl, was a three-toed sloth. Important, a three -toed. Uh, important distinction, not oh. a two-toed sloth. Oh, really? Yeah, so apparently this is one of Andy's kids' favorite animals. Mm -hmm. And as a family, they were even fortunate enough to see one in the wild in Costa Rica last Christmas uh, when they were on vacation. So it was all kind of fate leading up to this, I think. about that? This is Andy uh, Mogensen. Andy Mogensen, the pilot. That's uh, correct. That's right. And I guess his family calls him the slowest person in the world. So another reason why this three-toed sloth had such meaning for all of them. Well, that actual sloth in the uh, capsule looked like it was moving slow as well. But <laughs> he's got an excuse. You know, we have a saying in space, and it's often true. Yeah. Slow is smooth. Smooth is fast. Mm, and when you rush fun. too much, especially in space, doing a spacewalk or anything that you're doing, you get in trouble. So slow is smooth and smooth is fast. Wise words from our veteran space flyer, Jessica Meyer. Jessica Muir, sorry. It's early. <laughs> hey, we got some social questions. Let's take a few. You do mind? Absolutely. All right. Well, let's look on our screen here. And here we've got one uh, that says, come Sunday morning. Beautiful shot right there, though, of the spacecraft looking out the back. Boy, that is high-resolution image. Come Sunday morning, Earth Eastern Time, what are the first few tasks the crew will do, and how will they best acclimate and get dialed into their mission? Well, when we wake up in the morning on board the space station, we open up our computer and we have a plan that lays out our entire schedule for the day, whether it's scientific experiments, hardware, maintenance, whatever it is that you need to get done. I know what this crew will be doing, one of the first things they do, of course, is a safety briefing. So we want to make sure that they have all of the information they need in case they had any kind of situation on the space station where maybe they needed an emergency breathing mask or a fire extinguisher, anything like that. Safety first at NASA, and that's the first thing that we do when you arrive on board the space station as well. The veteran crew that is up there will take them through that, show them where everything is, talk through some of the main messages, and then they'll have a, a longer session usually the next day or later that week. They'll get a, get into their crew quarters. Usually your crewmates will 
do a favor for you and unpack some of your things so you don't have to do all that when you get there. You arrive to your crew quarters and already have some of the things that you need out, maybe even some pictures from home. When I arrived, my crewmates had really taken great care of me. They had decorated my crew quarters. Oh. I had pictures of my friends and family. Everything was all laid out, and that really made it a nice, smooth transition because those first few moments in space especially when you've never been there before as a rookie, you're not quite that graceful yet. You know, you don't have your space wings quite yet, and you're getting used to just moving around and being in that three-dimensional microgravity environment. And so you talk about, you know, getting used to the environment up there and having a little something from home is important, too. You, you took up a flight kit. These astronauts all have a flight kit. You, in fact, brought a few things that you took up into space. What were a couple of the more meaningful ones that you took? I did. You know, we often pictures of family and friends like we've talked about before or things that represent places we've been and worked. I brought up a, a picture of my, my wedding photo of my parents. Un unfortunately, my father had passed away before I went to space, so I wanted to have a, a piece of him up there with me. I brought up some things to represent other things along the way. My home state of Maine. I had uh, a university flag with me from my undergraduate oh, university. Yeah. Sometimes we bring up presents for each other because we're up there for birthdays or holidays. Drew Morgan, my crewmate, brought us these harmonicas. Nice harmonica. And briefly, let's uh, look at the screen here. We can see that uh, the nose cone uh, is deploying, and we have confirmation of it deploying. Beautiful shot there. Of course, the nose cone has to deploy in order for Dragon to connect up to the International Space Station. And uh, once this clears out of the way, it is quite a view. Depending on where Earth is in relation. It looks like we're pointed mostly in space, which makes sense. Sometimes you get an Earth view. There's a lot of space in space. <laughs> there is. There certainly is indeed. And then what else? There was, was, oh, you got well, something special. My one item that I brought that was my personal kind of selfish item that wasn't for anybody else was my panda. This is pandemonium. Oh. Look I've had him there. since I was five years old. Pandemonium. So he made his way to space with me as well. And we saw a lot of stuffed animals floating with these zero-G indicators. We saw that three-toed sloth. But Pandemonium was up there floating in all of his glory as well. And, <laughs> you know, these are all just things that remind us of home and really help us share the mission with everybody back home. All of these places and things that have meant something to us along the way because we did not get there alone. We got there with the support of so many people that helped us. And this mission is for everyone. It's really for all of humankind. So hopefully they can all share in. Absolutely. And thank you for sharing your flight kit uh, with us. This is especially, so, I mean, this is a 40-year-old uh, tour. Right 41. Uh, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's He's great. been He's, around the block. He, said, he just said he wants to go back to space. Ah, he does want to go, but we all want to go back to space. Okay. So hopefully he'll have another opportunity. We just got confirmation that uh, nose cone is fully deployed. And uh, so Dragon is on its way to the International Space Station. Now, a member of Crew 7 will kick off a major study that will give us a comprehensive look at how the human body is affected by time and space. Let's bring in now NASA's Jasmine Hopkins for more. As we saw this morning, the Commercial Crew Program launches astronauts from American soil, and this enables NASA's human research on the International Space Station. Joining us now to talk more about that is Kurt Costello, ISS Chief Program Scientist. Thank you for joining us, Kurt. Thanks, Jasmine. It's great to be here this morning. We are glad to have you here. So how does the Commercial Crew Program better enable NASA's human research? So uh, the Commercial Crew Program has enabled us to launch again from U.S. soil. And what that means is a lot of our sensitive science that needs to be loaded uh, within the last few hours before we launch can now be quickly transported from our labs here at KSC to the vehicle on the launch pad. So this enables us a late load capability that allows us to get 
uh, our samples, critical samples, onto the vehicles. And the commercial crew program has also enabled us to launch more frequently and regularly. So a lot of our sensitive uh, investigations that need specific timing for when we get those samples to the space station and then back down are enabled by that program. That is great, Kurt. And can you tell us a little bit more about the new human research investigation going to be part of Crew 7? Sure. Uh, I think you're referring to Cypher, and Cypher is not just one investigation, but 14 in one. And what it is really setting out to do is to help us understand with, uh, whether we have risks from my wife. to humans being in hey, space. Hey, I'm always uh, uh, the last to leave the house whenever we're going anywhere. Personally, I think it's with good reason. But they say I'm the slowest person alive, uh, which is also why it's a three-toed sloth, not a two-toed sloth, because apparently that would be too fast for me. So welcome to space, Sasha the Sloth. And Dragon, we appreciate the introduction to the OR zero G indicator and noting that that is uh, probably officially now the fastest sloth uh, ever. It, it, this is Satoshi. Uh, it's nice to be in space, and uh, I'm very glad to see happy faces. Yes, I'm very excited. First of all, a few words in Russian, then in English. Всем большое спасибо огромное в восхищении тем, как мы прокатились на ракете, мы в космосе. Невероятно. Полет в космос это результат действий скоординированных тысяч людей, которые работают в разных странах. Всем большое спасибо. Большое спасибо. Роскосмос, НАСА. Pizza, Jax, uh, SpaceX, uh, my friends and family, thank you very much. Thank you very much for all your hard work. SpaceX, Roscosmos, NASA, Ethan, Jax, and all the partners involved in manned space flight. That's a proud example of how much we can achieve working together in harmony. Let's continue. Cool. Thanks a lot to everyone, to my family as well. Thanks. SpaceX copies all. Thank you for the kind words. And Jaws, when you, if you are ready to copy, I do have some upcoming words on the phase burn. Expect a lot of signal. Good, Ellie. Dex, Dragon is ready to copy. Okay, wanted to give you an update that uh, we are going to be losing Tedris for voice comms for about 15, that's approximately one five minutes which is going to include that upcoming phase burn per year displays. We do have a ground station pass during that burn prep, so you will actually be able to call us in the blind. However, you will be LOS during the burn. There's no concerns, but we'll pick you back up at 0819 Zulu, which will be right after the burn, and we'll confirm that burn performance. How copy? SpaceX Dragon copies all. We'll leave, lose you on Tedris uh, for the phase burn, but we can make calls to the ground station in the blind, and we'll catch you on the backside at 0819. Good readback. Okay, you just heard some communication between Commander Jasmine Mogbelli and SpaceX's launch team. Just saying they're going to lose. Tedris connectivity, which will, um, during the burn, they'll be unable to communicate, but they've got a ground station that will catch them on either side of that. So communication will be established before and after the burn. Um, earlier, we heard some words from Andy Mogensen, of course. You told us that uh, that was a sloth. I wasn't sure that we were going to be able to you know, get some words from him, but it was good to hear from him and the other crew members about uh, you know now that they're in space and and sharing a message with the world. Absolutely, and we got a name, Sasha the Sloth. Sasha the Sloth, the fastest moving sloth ever to be a sloth. Yeah, uh, among the legendary, famous stuffed animals in space. That's now. right. It's a thing. Joins the long list of them, and so Jasmine, Andreas, Satoshi, and 
Constantine are on course to arrive at the International Space Station around 8.39 Eastern Time tomorrow. NASA TV, well, we will be wrapping up our coverage, but you can follow along with Crew 7's entire ride to the station and hear real-time audio from that space to ground, which we were listening to just then, on our mission audio stream on YouTube. Make sure you look for the link on our NASA social media accounts and in the description of the NASA YouTube launch broadcast. And though our coverage here at Kennedy Space Center is concluding, Crew 7's mission has only just begun. They'll get to the International Space Station in about 30 hours. It's going to be a long ride. Uh, but then they'll be able to meet uh, and join, I should say, Crew 7, Crew 7 to Crew 6. And that'll be quite a ceremony. Absolutely. You know, these first missions, these first moments in space are absolutely unforgettable. I'll never forget that feeling weightlessness for the first time. You're still strapped in your seat, but everything starts lifting up, your arms, your pencils, anything that was on the floor, the zero-G indicator, everything. And I remember looking across at my crewmate, just sharing those moments and those smiles. I know how happy those that crew is right now. I am so excited for them and their mission. It will take a little while, 30 hours, like you said, to get to Space Station, but they are in space right now, and I know they're enjoying every minute. Congratulations, Crew 7. We we are so excited for you. This is going to be an incredible mission on the International Space Station. Great words, Jessica. Appreciate those. And Crew 6 will be coming back down in about a week. They'll have a roughly five-day handover, and then they'll return. Next up for us is our post-launch news conference scheduled at 5 a.m. Eastern Time on NASA TV. And, of course, we'll have live joint coverage of docking and the Crew 7 welcome ceremony starting tomorrow at 6.45 a.m. Eastern Time on NASA TV as well as SpaceX's YouTube channel. You can find mission updates on X, at NASA, at SpaceX, and on the web at NASA.gov, including, again, the link to that mission audio stream if you want to stick around with Crew 7 and be with them on their entire journey. Well, before we sign off from Kennedy, I want to thank Jessica Meir for being here on the launch broadcast and sharing your incredible experiences and all your insight, answering the questions, bringing pandemonium and showing them off. Thank you so much. We really appreciate having an astronaut and especially you today on Crew 7 to, to share this with us. Well, it is absolutely my pleasure. Any good day when a rocket ignites is a great day for astronauts all around the planet. So we wouldn't miss out on it for the world. Very happy to be here and excited to share this moment with all of you. Thanks so much. And a huge thanks as well to all of our guests for joining us today. But most importantly, thank all of you for watching. For everyone here at NASA and SpaceX, have a great morning and keep looking up. We leave you now with a look back at highlights from suit up to liftoff. So we've got Crew 7 and they are doing their suit checkouts. Here they come, the astronauts walking down the hallway at astronaut crew quarters. And here they come, Crew 7, taking their first steps outside before their journey to space. Here they go, doors are closing. This begins the drive across NASA's Kennedy Space Center to launch pad 39A. And there's Jasmine Mobelli, the commander, and Andreas Mogensen, our pilot. There go our pilot and commander carefully getting in. And here come our mission specialists, Konstantin Borisov, and on the right, Satoshi Furukawa. Technicians working to close that side match. One, into full power, and liftoff. Go Falcon, go Dragon, go Krita. Endurance ascends an international crew Copy, destined for the International Space Station. Stage one That's propulsion is nominal. Good calls from the propulsion officers here. Propulsion's nominal.